Good morning, guys. Hope everybody's well. Happy Friday to everybody. Today is February 16th. Hope you guys are well. Uh, market's taking a little bit of a breather today, as you can see. Uh, on the morning, I saw most of the stock, most of the indices at least, excuse me, were a little bit lower. And of course, the meme stock of the day, some people don't want me to call it a meme stock. It's just a high-performing stock, which is SMCI. Super Micro is down about 12% or so. Obviously, I mean, it took a breather. It went up all the way to 1,000, now down to about 800s in the 880 range, about 10, 15% lower. Uh, but you know, we've got to see where it goes. I still think there's a little bit of room for it to go down, but we will see where it ends up. Okay, one of the stocks that came up on my radar is Mobileye. Now, a lot of people don't know about this company. Some of you may already know, but that's fine. What I wanted to be able to do was to talk and look at a little bit of the Advanced Driver Assistance system, Systems. A-D-A-S is what they're called, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. Uh, that's what Mobileye does. They make products that help you be able to get autonomous driving to become a reality. Uh, and there are a host of companies that are using their platform, their solutions, their products to be able to build those advanced driver assistance systems. And these are car companies all the way from Chiri, which is in China, to Audi and Lamborghini in Europe, to even other companies in the US, including Ford and GM. So what I wanted to do was just to take a deep dive, but not necessarily talk about mobile Mobileye alone. I wanted to take a little bit of a view into what is driver assistance systems? What does the future of autonomous driving look like? What are the different levels? What is important to understand? And then look at a little bit of the different companies, different approaches to this autonomous driving, then get into Mobileye, what they do, how they're different. So let's dive into it. Let me know what you guys think. Mobileye has been around for about a little over 20 years. The company was acquired by Intel. Intel still owns a big percentage of the company, even though they're public. So keep that in mind. The float, very much similar to ARM, which is the semiconductor uh, company, the fabulous IP management company. Uh, ARM also is controlled, nearly 80% of the stock is controlled by SoftBank. Mobileye, a lot of control is still with Intel. Intel took the company public in 2021, uh, 2022. And then since then, the company has middled, has middled in terms of performance. I really think it is an interesting company to see. So the company is based out of Israel in Jerusalem. They've been around for about 20 years, as I said, and they've moved from different kinds of systems over across to the current systems that exist. Okay, so what is advanced driver assistance technologies? Now, when you drive a car, you need a lot of systems to be able, mostly semiconductor and chip-based systems to help you make some of the things easier for you to drive. This reduces accidents, it increases driver capability, and also makes it easier to be able to have uh, the car itself be in a better shape. Now, there are five major systems that make up advanced driver assistance systems. The first one, which Tesla really, really likes, is cameras. So if you go and look at the, you know, any new model car, late model cars, they call it 2020 and even later, even some in the a little bit of earlier, I've got a 2022 uh, car, BMW and a Tesla. If you look at the later model cars, they have cameras in the front, in the back, and some of them even have it on the side, especially near the rear view mirrors or the side mirrors, excuse me, to be able to see if cars are coming on the side and be able to give you a 360 degree view, especially when you back up. You can see that in a lot of cars. They show you in the front on the screen dashboard, they will show you what is there at the back. It's easy to be able to, so you don't have to turn your, turn your back, do that kind of stuff. Cameras exist both in the front and back. And increasingly because of Uber, Lyft, a lot of cameras are also coming in the uh, in the dash cam, which is looking at it from the camera looking out. So it becomes easy to be able to record things when accidents happen so you can assign blame uh, for insurance companies. So camera is the, is the first one that helps make drivers' jobs when they're driving easier. The second one is the global positioning system. Global navigation satellite system is GNSS, global positioning system for most of us. So this is the ability to be able to find out where the car is as it goes around. Are you in a hilly area? Are you in a specific location that is more flat? Do you need assistance in that particular way? GNSS, GPS is the second set of subsystems that are needed 
to be able to make sure that you can find out exactly where people are in this journey. The third one is LiDAR. We'll go through every one of these in a little bit, right? There are a lot of LiDAR companies that went public sometime in 2020, 2021. Uh, Inox and Laser, LAZR is another company. A lot of them also consolidated. Inox was the third one. Uh, and so LiDAR is detection and ranging. Light, light detection and ranging gives you the ability to be able to point light to specific locations as opposed to sound, which is radar, and gives you the ability to be able to detect LiDAR is useful in certain cases. Now, of course, many of you who are Tesla bulls and followers of Elon Musk will say LiDAR is useless and, and Elon Musk has already said they are not useful. He's not right 100%. For the use cases that he's suggesting, he thinks that he can do enough with cameras. You need LiDARs if you want to be able to build a robust system, just like airplanes. Think of air, uh, advanced uh, driver assistance systems, just like when you're on an airplane, you need backup systems. Every time the plane lands, there are wheels, but they'll always have a backup. If the co-pilot fails, they'll always have a backup. If there's too much uh, pressure coming into the cabin, they'll always have a backup. You need to be able to reinforce systems that exist with other backup systems if in case one of them fails. LiDAR is a very good backup system. Radar exists as well. It's very good for targets. Okay, you're trying to go to a specific location. LiDAR and radar give you different capabilities. And then vehicle to uh, V2X, which is vehicle to uh, integra vehicle integration, vehicle to every other system, also is another set of systems that exist to be able to tell you when you're on the road, how far away is the car in front of you? How far is it behind? If there's a pole that you want to be able to park, how far does that look like? Now, every car company is looking at enhancing their cars. And even in the lower end models now, uh, Kia, Hyundai, they're all coming out with advanced driver assistance systems. Some of them may be very simple, like helping you park. Some of them may be more advanced, that helping you move across lanes, automatically signaling a turn when a lane comes, telling you it's okay to turn and change a lane and go back into lane. And some of them may be even more advanced, like the full service, full sorry, full speed self-drive like Tesla offers. But a combination of these systems is what every car company uses. So just to give you a feel for where these things exist, if you look at the Google um, cars, the self-driving car, which is now called Waymo as a company, you will see a LiDAR on the top that keeps rotating around, looking around, trying to be able to do autonomous driving. So LiDARs typically will be on the top. Cameras exist all over the place. So this one is showing you camera only in this particular place over on the top, but cameras exist even in the front, even at the back, and some cases, even as I mentioned, on your side mirrors over here. Now the GNSS antenna, which is the global navigation and satellite positioning system, that also will exist on the top along with the camera unit bolted. Now, some of these systems might look a little clunky, but they're getting better and better as the form factor starts to reduce and miniaturization of these chips happen. Uh, now, the second part of it, when you look at the central computer, what is happening very quickly in automobiles that I've seen from a lot of friends who are at Lucid and some friends who are at Tesla as well, is that centralized process processing allows you to be able to take the input from all of these and then be able to make decisions. But increasingly, each of these systems itself is starting to have a CPU. So they make local positioning systems and treat certain portions of the information in the central to be able to give overall direction. It's like saying LiDAR is telling me this, the LiDAR needs to be able to process. And then based on what the LiDAR has said, is it consistent with what the camera is saying? Is it different from what the GNP is, GN, GNSS or GPS is saying? That's the other part. Okay, the vehicle odometry itself is just very simple, which exists even with non-ASDS systems, which is the ability to be able to, or ADAS systems, which is the ability to be able to see how far is the car moving? What is the speed of the vehicle, et cetera? Uh, ultrasonics exist themselves. These are small positioning units. And then finally, radar systems. Radar systems also in the front and the back is what they exist. Okay, if you look at what Mobileye does, they have, four or five different products that they offer across the spectrum autonomous. If you want to start with very simple level one auto autonomous, all the way to level five, we'll go through that. They give you computer vision capability. They give you modeling and decision-making capability. They give you crowdsource mapping capability, radar and imaging, and then they've built it on top of their own system on chip, purpose-built system on chip computer capabilities and CPUs that they use in their own systems. Now, these are being used by at least over 200 different car manufacturers. These are things that Mobileye provides. They have about 135 million shipments that they've made since they have been around. Now, 
just to give you context, in the last quarter, about two weeks ago, Mobileye announced earnings and the talk a big hit. The reason is because in the last year, and if you remember two years ago, because of the semiconductor and the car specific chip shortage, a lot of companies ordered extra and have bought and kept a lot of inventory before they get into trouble for being able to not ship the cars in place given how many cars are in demand. So a lot of companies bought extra inventory into these car systems rose in 2023. And so they said, because of that inventory in 2024, they're gonna see a little bit of a period of consolidation where that inventory is eaten up. That doesn't mean that Mobileye is now suddenly going to go down. It just means that the inventory needs to be eaten up or inventory needs to be used. The cars need to be shipped before Mobileye can begin you know, shipping most of these systems again. They've done a great job. Just look at this, 2 million units shipped in 2014 and 15 times, nearly 15 to 20, 10 to 15 times the number of units shipped in just under about 10 years. So mobilize REM mapping. Now, they have different products, as I've said. They allow you to be able to range sensing. We'll go through every one of these, but each of these different products is used for different capabilities, different needs. We'll talk about all of them in particular. Now, when you look at level of automation, I talked a little bit about it, but let's go through that. There's no automation, which means the divers in full control is what we will call level zero. And that is really not automation in any sense. Now, when you go to the next level, there are two kinds of things that you need. You need one sensory capability and you need visual capability. Sensors kept in a lot of systems and cameras also kept in a lot of different systems. Now, the level one driver assistance is where we are right now for most companies. Most cars, low end and high end, will have a level one. Accelerometers tells you how fast things are going, ultrasonic sensors, rear view, front view cameras, uh, and also surround view cameras. So these are things that exist right now. And of course, partial automation where the driver will monitor all these systems where they still have their, they're still in control. They're still monitoring these systems. They're still driving it. Then um, this is when the driver is monitoring, driving, and you have to keep your hands on the wheel at these systems. Conditional automation, level three automation is when if there is an issue that comes up, the driver needs to be able to get control back into these systems. And that's where sensory fusion comes into place, reconstruction of where the lane is relative to other lanes, precise positioning more important becomes important. Right. And level three to five is where the automation. So FSD, full self drive, even though there is a claim from a lot of people that it's a level five, it's not level five. It's even close to maybe level three. So we're a little bit ahead. And in fact, I would argue, of course, a lot of people that disagree with me, they're still just level two. I have a Tesla. I've had it for a long time. So telling me that, OK, this is a level three is just wrong. That doesn't make any sense. I wouldn't trust it. Don't use it. I've tried it in even longer term uh, driving modes all the way from Seattle to Portland. It's not a level three. It's still a level two. Just keep that in mind when you go along. OK, now, each of these sensors and systems works for different requirements. If you want to be able to detect objects such as a lamppost, such as a stop sign, such as, for example, another car, uh, that is object detection. Just detect that it's there. The next step is classification of the object. Uh, cameras work okay for that, but LIDAR and radar work much, much better for object detection. Ultrasonics works very, very good as well. So if you look at the combination of these three, works in almost every case. So saying that only one thing is required, not a lot of things are required, um, is kind of disingenuous. Now, if you look at these and you start to line, so these are the capabilities, as you see, from detecting an object to classifying the object, estimating the distance, and so on and so forth. I'm not gonna go through every one of them, right? You will need a lot of these capabilities when you are, if not all of those capabilities, and a combination of these is what gives you the best kind of capability. So you have cameras, you have sensors, both ultrasonic sensors, radar centers, and LIDAR centers, and a combination gives you the capability to have everything that you need to get to full self-drive or level five automation. So make sure that you keep that in mind. Okay, now, another thing I talked about is each of these systems themselves require some level of processing. A sensor comes in. A sensor is essentially sensing things. It gives you signals that you have to then process to figure out, okay, am I detecting something? Am I classifying it as something else? Now, each of these systems, as I mentioned before, ultrasonic sensors, radar sensors, cameras, vehicle to everything, um, accelerator speed, they all give you certain amount of system signals. Those are processed intelligently on the edge because if you have to send all of these across to the CPU, 
which is the vehicle CPU itself, then it becomes very hard to be able to prioritize the right one. So each of them themselves will have a processor. It will detect certain elements. It will classify certain elements. Then it will send it across to a central processing unit. Uh, and then it actually makes a decision to be able to determine what we need to be able to do based on that. The CPU on the system not controls not only the sensors, it also controls the infotainment system and also other vehicle dynamics and control systems. So they keep that as one of the most important things. So why is this important? You need system on chip for each of these individual sensor elements besides the central processing chip as well. Okay, we're gonna go through every one of these just at a high level to give you a little bit of a view. Mobileye is doing something that I think is very, very unique and different in the space. Now, a lot of people understand it, some people don't understand it, but this is one of those companies that don't worry about the stock in the short term if you believe that autonomous driving is something that we are all going to be doing in five, we're all going to be doing in five to 10 years. There is competition, no doubt about that. There's a lot of competition for Mobileye, but they're one of the unique companies in the space in the move and the march towards autonomous driving. Okay, so they have uh, a lot of, so machine vision is the first portion. How do you take cameras and how are you able to go ahead and generate Detection of the objects, classifying of the objects themselves. So going from a version generation three level product to generation four level product gives you a lot more automation capabilities. That's the first step, mobile vision. Second one is LIDAR. The second part is light detection and ranging, which is using sensors to send laser beams, very high frequency laser beams. And there, by the way, there are a lot of LIDAR companies. Um, Luminar was one of the companies, LAZR, Innovis, there's quite a few companies and a lot of them are public as well, keep that in mind. And some of these companies, smaller companies are going to get acquired. Mobilize is a little bit bigger. They're in the in the 10 to $200 billion range, in the mid-size range. They're not in the small company range. A lot of the companies in the LiDAR space are a billion or two billion or even less than that in terms of market cap. So what LiDAR does very, very well is send out, as I said, laser beams, very high frequency beams, very consistently, very frequently, capture the resolution to build a complete map. So if you put a lot of light in high frequency, you can get a detection of what that space looks like, what that object looks like, what are the contours of that object. And distances of the object is works very, very well for what they would call <coughs> near field detection, not for long range detection. Long range is still more than 200 meters, but if you're in the lane and you're looking at 50 to 75 to 100 meters, maybe 200 meters, you wanna be able to get a quick sense of what that object is. Once you detect that object, you might get, send a multiple bunch of lights and that each of those lights gives you depth sensory, gives you visual sensory that then builds for you the image of that object, okay? So it could be a stop sign, could be anything else. So that's LIDAR, light detection and ranging. Next one is radar. Radar is radio detection and ranging, usually typically used for being able to use noise, right? It, it works in certain situations. It doesn't do very well when there's other noise, which is almost always the case in, in, in looking at when you're driving, right? You will, it'll detect a radio signal towards the object, receive the signal, and it's very good for distance mapping as opposed to for detection of the object itself. So range gives you the ability, uh, and you know, as opposed to light detection, this one works a lot more effectively when you are trying to detect speed of a specific object as opposed to the object classification itself. And then GNSS or global navigation satellite systems or GPS systems, good for being able to tell you where you are, send signals back into the satellite, understand where you are, understand the terrain of that map, along with the map, right? So you've got a map of the place, you've got terrain of the place, the GSS tells you mapping where you are exactly. And that gives you the ability to be able to say what kind of a range that you need to have in terms of the shift and the tilt and the movement of that. Vehicle to everything, V2X, this is another. So we talked about the five different, I'm gonna bring it back and summarize for you. But vehicle to vehicle, which is how do you communicate with other vehicles to prevent uh, collisions? Vehicle to infrastructure, for example, can I detect that there is a traffic signal and I can go faster if it is green and slower if it is red. Uh, don't worry about vehicle, the motorcycle is the same as vehicle to vehicle. Vehicle to object usually typically means an object that is stationary or an object that is in slow moving and then vehicle to pedestrian. So you want to be able to make sure you have sensors that can help you understand what systems exist and avoid collisions. So let me summarize this for you again, in terms of going back and telling you what are the different systems that are needed. To be able to do full surf drive, you need all of these systems 
You need vehicle to everything. You need camera detection. You need global positioning. You need LIDAR and you need radar. Now, can are some of these systems a repetition? Are they using a couple of different systems together? Yes, they are. But that's the whole point of being able to do these because you are trying to get a full map with two, three points of view as opposed to with one point of view. So you need multi-sensor multi -sensor fusion for advanced driver assisted systems to level five autonomous driving. So you lose these three, four separate systems, you predict the state of where it's going to be, and then you filter out noise, which is uh, a fancy term for useless information versus signal, which is a fancy term for good information. So noise to signal ratio needs to be fairly low or the signal to noise ratio needs to be fairly high. Make sense? Okay, now what Mobileye does is they want to be able to get to the point of no driver actually worrying about driving, uh, which is what Waymo does already to a certain extent. They use some of the products from Mobileye as well. Google uses some of the, oh, Waymo. let me call it Waymo, not Google. Now, at ADA systems, a lot of companies already do that right now. The driver has their hands and their eyes on the car. The hands are off, the eyes are off. This is the next version, the supervision system. Um, then you go to the eyes are off also system, chauffeur, and then drive. So those are the four products. Uh, ADAS systems, all the way to drive, which is Mobileye drive. So they have chauffeur as well. These are different product families that Mobileye offers. Uh, and that gives you the capability to understand they're looking and thinking into the future, not just here and now. So they have about 275 million volume systems of the ADAS systems right now. Even simple cars, Hyundai, as I mentioned, Kia, they all give you this capability. About 3 million to 4 million cars for supervision um, in terms of lifetime volume, but I think they'll start to increase it so far. They're only 3.5 million. They, they will expect to have it even higher. And then um, they will increase it even further with chauffeur systems and then even more with drive systems. This will start to go higher and higher. Just keep that in mind. This 249 million ADAS systems is going to get to this point uh, very, very quickly. Drive systems, over the next 10 years, you will see autonomous cars, hopefully level five, but even getting better at level three and level four from where the level two right now is. So what does that mean in terms of the capabilities of the systems themselves? Uh, at the level, at the eyes on, eyes on and hands on, which is uh, the autonomous driving level one, if you will, you still have front and back camera. You will have supervision, which is light, a little bit of back camera as well. Side camera is going in. The chauffeur systems not only have that, but they also have LIDAR and they have imaging capabilities. And then you move about from there, you have surround cams and you also have complete camera. So from cameras, just basic cameras, front camera, you enhance it with a rear camera with some radar. You enhance that with a LIDAR. You enhance that with software and imaging capabilities. And of course, you will add GPS even at the front face going all the way to managed all along. So the estimated pipeline, just in terms of the cars that the manufacturers of cars have told them is about $7.4 billion worth, right? In 2023 alone, they've won that. Uh, they should have about 60 million units shipped with the systems that exist. Now this is the pipeline, this is not their actual system. So in terms of models, about 300 different models from Nissan and Honda, all the way to Volkswagen is the number one producer of all cars in the world. Um, so they will have a lot of cars that they, new models that they're going to launch as well. Volkswagen, then GM, Toyota, BMW. So all of these guys are customers of Mobileye and they're launching new cars at different levels. And now even the um, Chinese OEMs, uh, Cherry, SEIC, uh, BYD will also get there in a, in a, in a little bit of time, I think. Uh, just as an example, here are some of the cars uh, that they are looking to be able to launch over the next few, whether it's an EV car or it's a internal combustion engine car or a hybrid car, if you will, all of these are using. So even when you believe that the future is not EV alone, it doesn't matter. Mobileye will do well regardless of whether it's a, uh, EV world only, or if it is a uh, internal combustion engine world or a hybrid world of some sort, if you will. Lots of new models to be launched. So I think that's the big part of it. Now, supervision itself, um, uh, Chiri is actually working with Mobileye to be able to launch new and cover 100 different cities. So this is one of the few companies that actually has gained quite a bit of traction in China. Are there competitors? Yes, there are competitors. So some of the capabilities, they have system on chip, they give you computer vision, they do mapping of the, of the location, uh, driving policy-based systems, they give you the complete uh, on-field system unit, chip unit itself, and they give you a bunch of active sensors. So cameras, they can actually go from 
just cameras alone to sensors as well. They give you appearance-based systems to geometry-based, and then they give you the capability to be able to do deep learning and sensing of these so that the algorithms get better. So it's not just hardware. It's also algorithms that go in to be able to help you detect even better. The products themselves give you the capability to be able to have completely all of these done in a single unit. So it makes it a lot more better. And of course, they're using people such as uh, Taiwan Semiconductor to be able to manufacture these. But the number of units, this will pale in comparison to mobile and AI. Just keep that in mind. Okay, now driving policy itself comprises of three different things. When do you need to do something? When you get to a stop sign, for example, what do you need to do when you get there? And then how do you do, do it? Which is the braking profile. Do you need to pump the brake or do you need to be able to press on the brake? So those are essentially how they take those policies that need to happen and then create algorithms that move into that. Remember, I talked about five different systems that exist. Each of these need to be able to think of it as an axis of redundancy. Redundancy is exactly what, uh, what airplanes also do. For every unit of Boeing and Airbus designs, there has to be a redundancy. Something is a backup in case the first one fails. Of course, if the backup also fails, you're screwed. But you need to be able to do this. So when people tell me, okay, you just need a camera and that's it, I think they're wrong. I don't think they're wrong. I know that they're wrong. You need to be able to have redundancy in real world systems when you get to level five, level six, or level four, level five autonomous driving. Uh, and looking at approaches that are, okay, you can do camera versus LIDAR radar. That's on the system side. Do you do end-to-end -end approaches with the decomposers? You'd be able to do uh, appearances based on geometry. Or, sorry, you can look at systems based on geometry, which is you put the progression map across math mathematical models, or do you do based on appearance itself? And then you do learning-based models. Now, when you look at cameras and you're looking at decomposable objects, you're trying to essentially, each of these detection systems and algorithms, essentially, you make a small unit and then you make that unit into, into a larger unit. You decompose the system into what you can object. Now, LIDAR also does decomposable geometry and then image rating itself, uh, radar as well. Now, driving policy is very difficult because uh, there is no central place that you can go to that says this is all the rules that comprise how you'll be able to do it. And the reason is because it comprises of 17, 18 different units of measure that you need to be able to take and then making sure that you can detect and also then handle what uncertainties happen. Uh, that's mobile eye. I still haven't talked about a lot about the company's units and uh, just the products themselves were what I covered. Now let's go into our five-step process to figure out what is it the company has done from a uh, unit perspective, what they've done from a fundamentalist perspective, and then what they've done from a stock perspective. So this is mobile eye. Let's go through our five-step process. First step in the process is looking at the annualized income statement and fundamentals, and then we will go to the remaining set of analysis. Okay, the company did about 800 million 2018 and nearly two times that, more than two times that in 2023. So growing at about 10%. So this is a 20 year old company. Don't expect it to grow at 100%, uh, but still growing at 30, 40% and then coming back to their norm of about 11%. So this is a little bit of a challenge. Don't like this very much. Profitable, uh, they're losing a little bit of money. That's not a good sign, but they're losing very little money. They should get to the point of profitability fairly soon. Let's look at it from a quarterly basis. Okay, so they don't have the growth. Again, they went public fairly recently. Uh, to 12% growth, not very high growth, not a great sign. Now they've finally gotten the point. Look at this, two quarters in a row, they're actually getting to a profitability. Uh, right. That's a good sign. It's a good sign, but still, they weren't profitable before. Balance sheet, they have about $1 billion in actual cash, the rest of it in non-current assets, of which intangible assets are 13 billion. Goodwill, yeah, the, the 1 billion, a little over a billion. What am I going to say? Almost $2 billion in cash, but no debt. This is a beautiful, clean balance sheet. I love this balance sheet. No debt at all. I love it. Absolutely love it. So what, $2 billion in cash? They've just stopped losing money, which is a good sign as well. And cash flow, decent. Decent cash flow to an extent to be able to support the business. Uh, in terms of uh, the valuation, they don't have PE yet because they've just started. So you don't have annual uh, they should have had something over here, at least given that. But still, 10 times sales for a company growing at 13%. Uh, 10% to 13%. What do they grow in the most recent quarter? 11%, I think. Yeah, 12%. Not a great uh, sign, but so 10 times, that's a lot. Uh, 10 times PS is a lot. But again, once they start to be able to take the 50% margin growth and 10% is net margin. So once they get that 10%, so what are they doing in terms of revenue? They're doing roughly, let's go back here. They're doing about $2 billion in revenue. So $2 billion in revenue, if you take 10% of that, it's about $200 million, right? For the trading 12 months. So $200 million 
roughly, and their valuation right now is 20 billion. So their valuation is rich, even from a PE perspective is rich. Yes, they have about 10 times, wow, to 200 million, 20 billion, that was in PE and 10 times PS. So 50% gross margins, 10% net margins. This is rich again, but even with the stock price being low, it's a little bit of rich, but you wanna be able to make sure that you understand what the growth profile looks like. The question with mobile eye, just a summary standpoint, from a fundamental standpoint, I would give this a seven, six or seven. Growth is slow, that's a big issue. It's just turned profitable and valuation is a little bit rich. Margins are not bad, but yeah, now I can understand why a lot of people are complaining about this stock. The valuation is still rich, even though the stock is down. So they went public in 2022, October 2022, uh, moved up all the way, very nice move up. And then consolidation phase, I would call this more than anything else. And this is just a stage four decline. So stage one, stage two markup, stage three uh, consolidation, stage four markdown. This is the markdown phase. And we're still in the markdown phase. Seems like the markdown phase, this candle indicates to me on the long term, we're in a markdown phase or we're just consolidation phase stage number one. I'd like to think it's stage number two, but no, no. You look at this, this is still in a markdown phase. Um, still going down. So there's no real reason. In the longer term, this is still going down. Uh, in the in the weekly chart, it's still going down. So that's what this looks like. Has it formed a base? It's tried to actually bounce off of the base here 25 a couple of times. So it doesn't seem like it wants to go below 25, which is where it is right now. Now, can it, will it go lower? You've got to be able to check that. On the daily None of the none of the moving averages are pointing in the right direction for me to say go buy this right now. But for the longer term, this looks like it's actually bouncing. You want to check. That's what I want to be able to check. So after earnings took a little bit of a beating, uh, and even it announced that this is going to get. So this is actually in a stage four decline. Uh, this doesn't give me any indicate. This is not bad. MACD is not bad. So momentum is slightly building, but this doesn't give me any confidence that I want to be able to buy it right now. Wait for the move a little bit at least up to the 27 zone if you want to be able to get long on this stock. Still, on a summary basis, you need a lot of different systems. Mobileye has got a lot of wins. They've got a lot of inventory already in existing systems. They're not growing too fast at 10%, 12% year on year. So the stock actually had done quite a bit of consolidation in this phase, took a bit of a beating on the daily chart. Actually, this was in January, strong beating after, after that. And then the earnings actually, when they announced, they pre-announced earnings, and then they went down a little bit. And now they're bouncing off of the 25 range. I'm going to wait to see if it actually bounces off the 25 range because the all-time low is probably a little bit lower. The all-time low, when they after they went public, the all-time low is somewhere in the 24, 25 range. So they're probably going to bounce off of this range is my guess. Um, Got to wait for it. See if it moves up a little bit above this cluster zone, which seems to be quite a bit. And the, this is where you want to see. You want 29 is a safety zone, but it might move at least from here. My sense is this is a long-term technology. If you buy it right now, you're buying, you want to wait for the confirmation, but you can buy it over here. And this is going to go up. In about three years, you won't be surprised. I won't be surprised to see the stock closer to the 40, 50 range. Thank you very much for watching. Please comment. Let me know what you think about it. Have a great weekend, everybody.